from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! These are issues that have been around for a long time, and the federal government, the state government, and local government oftentimes have not operated in the best interest of people of color and poor people and disenfranchised people. From the Gulf to the Gulf, scholars and survivors testify at a People's Commission of Inquiry to assess whether President Bush and his administration have committed crimes against humanity. We'll be joined by New Orleans community activist Malik Rahim. We call for a full investigation of the murders that occurred in New Orleans, either uh, committed by the New Orleans Police Department or by the vigilante groups that was allowed to run amok in the city. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Reuters is reporting White House officials will learn today whether Special Prosecutor Patrick Fitzgerald will seek indictments over the Bush administration's outing of undercover CIA operative Valerie Plame. Reports indicate the grand jury could indict both President Bush's chief advisor Karl Rove and Vice President Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff, Lewis Scooter Libby, for perjury or conspiracy. Both Rove and Libby failed to disclose key information about their role in the leak to the grand jury. Late last week, Fitzgerald launched a website prompting speculation. He set it up to post the indictments. Fitzgerald has already posted documents that reveal the Justice Department gave him authority two years ago to expand his inquiry to include any criminal attempts to interfere with the investigation. Meanwhile, New York Times reporter Judith Miller remains in the headlines. She is the reporter who spent 85 days in jail for initially refusing to testify before the grand jury about the CIA leak. On Friday, the paper's executive editor, Bill Keller, accused Miller of misleading the paper about her involvement in the CIA leak investigation. Keller also admitted he should have been quicker to correct Miller's stories about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. On Sunday, the paper's public editor, Byron Kalami, wrote, quote, it seems to me that whatever the limits put on her, the problems facing her inside and outside the newsroom will make it difficult for her to return to the paper as a reporter. Meanwhile, Times columnist Maureen Dowd headlined her Sunday piece about Miller, quote, woman of mass destruction. The possible indictments over the CIA leak come at a time the White House is facing intense pressure on a number of fronts. In Iraq, the U.S. death toll will soon pass 2,000. In Washington, calls are increasing for Bush to withdraw his nomination of Harriet Myers to the Supreme Court. And a series of high-profile Republicans have publicly criticized Bush's handling of the country. Last week, Colin Powell's former chief of staff, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, accused Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld of running a cabal that is undermining the country's democracy. And now former National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft has slammed the Bush administration in an interview with The New Yorker magazine. He directed much of his criticism to the neoconservatives and their handling of Iraq. He said, quote, this was said to be part of the war on terror, but Iraq feeds terrorism. Scowcroft, who's close friends with George H.W. Bush, admitted it was difficult to criticize the sitting president. When the New Yorker reporter Jeffrey Goldberg asked Scowcroft if the son was different from the father, he said, quote, I don't want to go there. When Goldberg asked him to name issues on which he agrees with the younger Bush, Scowcroft said, quote, Afghanistan. He then paused for 12 seconds. Finally, he said, quote, I think we're doing well on Europe. Scowcroft went on to say, quote, the real anomaly in the administration is Cheney. I consider Cheney a good friend. I've known him for 30 years, but Dick Cheney, I don't know anymore. In Iraq, the U.S. death toll has reached 1,996. Anti-war groups, including the American Friends Service Committee and Peace Action, have called for demonstrations to be held around the country to mark the 2,000th American killed in Iraq. The number of Iraqis killed since the invasion is unknown, but estimates put the total at over 100,000. Meanwhile, a new poll commissioned by the British military has found 82% of Iraqis strongly oppose the continued presence of foreign troops. Less than 1% of the British population feels foreign troops have helped improve security in Iraq. The poll also found 45% of Iraqis feel attacks against U.S. troops are justified. On Saturday, the Pentagon admitted four U.S. contractors working for Halliburton were killed last month in Iraq. The military officially announced the killings took place 
only after a report was published in the Telegraph newspaper of London. Here in this country, Hans Blix accused the Bush administration of misleading the world about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Blix, the former chief UN weapons inspector, spoke in Boston on Friday. Well, you see, I, I have never maintained that the administration deliberately misled. I think they misled themselves, that we can see, and then they misled the world. Former Chief UN Weapons Inspector Hans Blix. In other news from the Middle East, the United States, Britain, and France are calling for tough international measures against Syria following the release of a UN report that implicates top Syrian and Lebanese officials in the assassination of the former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. Representatives from the three countries are expected to press the issue at a meeting of the UN Security Council set for Tuesday. A Syrian government source told the Financial Times permanent council members Russia and China said they would block punitive measures against Syria. Syria has rejected the report's findings. The UN is expected to release another report this week that will increase international pressure on Syria. The new report is expected to accuse Syria of not complying with UN Resolution 1559 which calls for an end to outside political and military interference in Lebanon. Here in this country, thousands have evacuated southwestern Florida to escape Hurricane Wilma, which made landfall this morning. The Category 3 storm battered Florida with winds of 125 miles per hour. In Broward, the county's emergency management director said Hurricane Wilma may be the worst storm to hit the area in half a century. The storm has already devastated the Yucatan coast in Mexico, leaving 15,000 people homeless. Wilma marks the eighth hurricane to hit Florida over the past 14 months. Meanwhile, Tropical Storm Alpha has hit Haiti in the Dominican Republic Sunday. Alpha is the 22nd named system in the Atlantic Ocean this season, making 2005 the most active hurricane season in 150 years. For the first time ever, weather officials had turned to the Greek alphabet for a storm's name. In New York, a state Supreme Court judge has convicted an undercover police officer of negligent homicide in the killing of an African immigrant two years ago. The officer, Brian Conroy, shot the unarmed Usman Zango during a raid on a CD duplication plant inside a Manhattan warehouse. Zango had spoken little English. He was in the warehouse working on restoring African artifacts. The officer faces up to four years in prison. Conroy could have faced a 15-year prison term, but the judge cleared him of second-degree manslaughter. Meanwhile, on Saturday, protests were held across the country to mark the 10th annual National Day of Protest Against Police Brutality. And new Justice Department statistics show the U.S. prison population has grown by nearly 2 percent to nearly 2.3 million this year. According to the International Center for Prison Studies in London, there are more people behind bars in the United States than in any other country in the world. Federal prisons in this country are now at 40 percent over capacity. And the Washington Post is reporting the FBI has conducted clandestine surveillance on some U.S. residents for as long as 18 months at a time without proper paperwork or oversight. Government records indicate the FBI has investigated hundreds of potential violations related to its use of secret surveillance operations. In one case, FBI agents kept an unidentified target under surveillance for at least five years, including more than 15 months without notifying Justice Department lawyers after the subject had moved from New York to Detroit. In other cases, the Washington Post reports agents obtained emails after a warrant expired, seized bank records without proper authority, and conducted an improper, unconsented physical search. And those are the headlines. This is Democracy Now! The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. This past weekend, survivors and scholars testified at an People's Commission of Inquiry set up to present evidence and assess whether President Bush and his administration have committed crimes against humanity from the Gulf to the Gulf. 
Inspired by the Not In Our Name Statement of Conscience, a panel of jurors gathered Friday to put the Bush administration's policies to the test of international law and a jury of conscience. The tribunal focused on four categories of indictable crimes, wars of aggression, torture, and indefinite detention, destruction of the global environment, and tax on global public health, with an emphasis on the AIDS epidemic. Day two of the tribunal focused solely on the administration's response to Hurricane Katrina. The hearing consisted primarily of eyewitness testimony from victims, together with accounts from rescue workers and testimony from experts on the Bush administration's actions and policies before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina. Today, we'll spend the hour hearing the testimony on, uh, at the commission. But first, we're joined in our studio by one of those who spoke before the tribunal, Malik Rahim, veteran of the Black Panther Party in New Orleans. For decades, he's worked as an organizer of public housing tenants, both there as well as in San Francisco. He recently ran for New Orleans City Council on the Green Party ticket. We welcome you to Democracy Now! Thank you. It's good to have you with us. It's always a pleasure to be here. Well, I last saw you in New Orleans, in Algiers. Yes. Uh, here you are today. What are you calling for? What is your demand? Why did you speak before the tribunal? During uh, the aftermath, uh, directly after the flooding uh, in New Orleans, hunting season begun on young African-American men. In Algiers, I believe approximately around 18 African American males were killed. No one really know what's the overall count. And they was basically murdered. They was murdered by either the police or by uh, vigilantes that was allowed to run amok. Uh, if it would have been, uh, if these roles would have been reversed. Uh, right now, it would be an investigation. It would, someone would have to pay. But now, because it's African Americans, and we're talking about in the Deep South, where racism have always existed, there's no care. Uh, we had uh, young African American men that were slaughtered on I-10. They said they had weapons. But at the same time, vigilantes was able, white vigilante groups was able to, to ride unchecked by anyone. How do you know they were killed there on the highway? Because it was broadcast. And it, uh, one thing about that I found in tragedies that uh, word spreads like wildfire, and uh, especially when it, such dastardly deeds are done. Uh, these young men was killed, they say they had weapons. But if they did, I mean, why the double standard? Why bodies was allowed to lay out in Algiers until they fester and rot? I want to stop you at that point. Um, listeners and viewers may remember when we went down to New Orleans and Algiers, uh, Malik Rahim took us around the corner to a community health center, a multi-service center, um, and he showed us a uh, body. We're going to go back to that day, and, well, as you showed us the body, a number of different levels of law enforcement went by. Let's go back. You could basically smell it from right here. You know, and the and police, they pass by, they look at it, and uh, but they ain't gonna do nothing, you know, to pick it up. Malik then walked us down the driveway next to the health center and lifted up a sheet of corrugated metal marked with an X, revealing the dead body underneath. Now his body been here for almost two weeks, two weeks tomorrow, all right, that this man been body been laying here. And there's no reason for it. Look where we at. I mean, it's not flooded. There's no reason for, there's no reason for them to be and left that body right here like this. I mean, that's just totally disrespect. You know, and I mean, two weeks, every day we ask them about come and pick it up. And they refused to come and pick it up. And you can see it is, it's literally decomposing right here, right out in the sun. Every day we sit up.